Another pair of important definitions are the ideas of moral agency and moral status. A moral agent is an entity that can discern right from wrong. In a scenario, a moral agent is the entity performing an action. If an entity is considered a moral agent, it will be responsible for the moral outcome of its actions. Humans are moral agents, but with a level of agency that varies with age and mental health. Toddlers, for instance, are not responsible for their actions in the same way that adults are. In a trial, mental illness can be used to argue for the limited moral agency of defendants, excusing them from some responsibility for their moral outcomes. Moral status refers to the entities affected by an action. It is related to the permissibility of using someone or something as a means toward reaching a goal. For instance, in the case of abortion, differences in the perceived moral status of an embryo can be polarizing. Pro-choice advocates consider early embryos to have a lower moral status than children and adults, and so they find abortion permissible in some circumstances. Pro-life advocates assign embryos a moral status that is equivalent to that of children and adults, and so they equate abortion to murder. But are machines moral agents and should they enjoy a moral status? The moral status and agency of machines has been an important topic of discussion among moral philosophers in recent years. Here we see a range of perspectives. Some scholars think AIs have no moral status and limited moral agency. Others are not so quick to dismiss the moral status and agency of machines. The argument is that machines cannot be simply conceptualized as tools. And this is particularly true of robots designed intentionally as companions for humans. In fact, there is a growing body of evidence that people develop attachment to machines, especially robots, suggesting the moral status that many people assign to them is not equivalent to that of a tool like a hammer, but actually closer to something like a beloved toy or even a pet. In battlefield operations, Soldiers have been known to form close personal bonds with Explosive Ordnance Disposal Robots, or EODs, giving them names and even mourning their deaths. Similar findings have been found regarding the use of sex robots. There are also reports of people becoming attached to robots in more mundane settings, like feeling gratitude towards cleaning robots. These examples tell us that moral status cannot be seen either as an abstract and theoretical consideration or as a black or white characteristic, but rather as a more nuanced phenomena that should not be dissociated from social context. Nevertheless, the moral status of most machines remains limited. In the famous trolley problem, people would hardly object to someone stopping an out-of-control trolley by pushing a smart refrigerator onto the tracks. For the most part, it is acceptable for humans to replace, copy, terminate, delete, or discard computer programs and robots. People, however, do attribute some moral status to robots, especially when they are equipped with the ability to express social cues. The moral agency of machines can also be seen as part of a continuum. For the most part, robots are considered to have relatively little moral agency, as they are expected to be subservient to humans. Moreover, much of moral agency resides in the definition of goals and tasks, and since machines are more involved in doing than on deciding what needs to be done, they are usually excluded from intellectual responsibility. The moral status and agencies of machines are relevant concepts, yet for the purpose of this course, we take two steps back and ask instead, how do people perceive machines? We focus on how people judge machine actions not in and on themselves, but in comparison to the same actions performed by humans. This positions this book squarely in the literature contributing to the perception of machines as moral agents, being mute about the perceived moral status of machines.